All right, everybody. Welcome to another Digital Dungeon Master Vodcast. And uh, today, this beautiful gentleman in front of you now is Mr. James Ward. I like how you're looking around. I see nobody beautiful where I'm sitting. <laughs> And uh, it's a it's an honor to have uh, you on the Digital Dungeon Mad Master Vodcast. It's it's like I was uh, telling you as we were getting ready to go live. You know, uh, I ha I now have uh, Bell that's doing all of my social media stuff, and she's helping me behind the scenes. And she asked me, you know, who are the first two people that you want to get on your vodcast? And I brought up you and and uh, Mister Hurd. So. Next day, she comes back and said, "Yeah, they're committed." I'm like, "Holy cow! That was that was it took me by, you know, it took me by surprise." So, thank you I so much, people. Yeah, yeah. I pr I really appreciate you coming on and you know being here with me today. So yeah, it's 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 really great to to have you and you know your gods, deities, and and heroes. I got this. In fact, I remember back in the day. Uh, I used to get little flyers in the mail uh, sure. from from TSR, and man, James, I, I used to wait every day by the mailbox because when you're ten years old or eleven years old, and you go through the mail every day, and when you see something with your name on it, yeah, you are it. you feel like the most important person in the world. So I remember they were doing a, and these were already years old already, and. I had seen this and I, I'd see there was like a little black and white picture on the flyer. So I remember it was like a, it was like a $5 mail in order. So it was like seven or $8 and yep. man. Yeah, this is, this is good stuff has a, I like how it has a lot of the, the different mythologies and, and stuff like that for, you know, the, the content inside of the, the book. So, but yeah, that's a uh, welcome. I, I, I really appreciate you. She, really appreciate you being on and so how did how did you get into you know playing whether it was tactical you know like uh maybe uh axis and allies maybe or was it something like a tactical game that you got into first or was it was it actually something like D D or boot hill that that, that got you interested okay, this is my favorite story to tell oh so it right now so the time is 1974 I just graduated from college with a teaching degree and every Tuesday I would go over to the bookstore in Lake Geneva and because they would get in science fiction and fantasy books every Tuesday so every Tuesday I'd go over and buy a couple books now one Tuesday I was there and I was going down the rows and I had seven paperbacks in my hand you know, it was like Conan the Barbarian and Andrea Norton and, and a couple of books like that. And, and people keep asking me what the names of the books were, and I, I don't remember what they were. <laughs> but anyway, when I got to the end of the book row, beside, right beside me was this biker dude. And he had uh, ripped up blue jeans. He had a blue jean jacket. He had one of those big chain wallets, you know, that uh, <laughs> the bikers have all the time. Yeah. And he had a beard. It looked kind of scruffy. And that was Gary Gygax. And he had the exact same seven books in his hand that I had in my hand. Oh, my gosh. No way. <laughs> I know. We thought that was very <laughs> interesting. We started talking about reading books and what we liked. And he said that he had a game where I could play Conan the Barbarian and fight Set. And oh, oh, wow. he me hook, line, and sinker. I was so hooked. So I went over to his house a couple weekends later, and I rolled up a wizard. And uh, started playing D and D, and I just I just loved it, just loved it. That's, wow! I got started in in role playing. Wow! So so how long did you did you get to play with Gary before, you know, was this when TSR was already formed, or was this like in the just in the beginning of of D and D? That's a fair question. The TSR had had just been formed, and. Uh, and they, they were working out of their houses, out of three different houses. Oh, wow. So this is yet. And uh, they were just doing the brown box set. So many, many a weekend I spent in Gary's basement playing D&D &D and putting the white label on the brown box set. Boy, I wish I had a couple of those now. Oh, <laughs> there was I know. 
months now. It's crazy money. Yeah. Crazy money. But uh, yeah, we would. Uh, I would label them, and then they'd ship them out. They they got five thousand right away, and I bought one for ten bucks, and uh, and they shipped them out. They sold pretty quick, and then they did another ten thousand, and that's how things got started. Wow. So was that so? Did Gary approach you and say, "Hey, we want you to come on on board with TSR"? Or yeah, that's a good question. You're asking good questions. No, we were playing <laughs> in the, um, and. Uh, and I said to Gary, Gary, we need a science fiction version of D&D because it's so much fun. And Gary says, Jim, you know, you're right, but I don't have time to write it. Why don't you give it a try? And so I started in 1975. I wrote Metamorphosis Alpha, which was the first science fiction yeah. role-playing. Wow. And, uh, and then, then I said, to, I was teaching at the time. I was uh, teaching in a small high school. Um, and I told Gary, Gary, anytime you can afford my salary, give me a call and I'll come on to work for you. And awesome. so in 1980, he gives me a call, Jim, how much money are you making? I said, $9,700 a year, Gary. And he says, no problem, Jim. Come on down. You're working for me. And oh, so that's said, awesome. Summer of, yeah, it was really awesome. Summer of 1980. Wow. So... You know, you made Metamorphosis Alpha, first sci-fi game, and Gamma War was also, was that your creation? Was that the same type of conversation with Gary saying, hey, we need to get like this apocalyptic world out there too? Or, or was that something? Because I think your company was Ward. Was it Ward Company or something like that? I didn't have any of that then. No, it was oh. But anyway, um, we got a ton of mail. Um, from players of the game that, that loved Metamorphosis Alpha, but they said yeah. they wanted to play on a planet. Ah. So we decided to do Game World, um, and and that turned out very well too. That was the first apocalyptic role-playing game, and the rest is history. So you guys, you guys basically had the entire share I, I well, i'm sure that by this point in what 70 you said summer of 75 or 76 when you started or 80 i'm sorry it was 80 right started full time there yeah so I, i'm sure there weren't many game companies there that were you know publishing books so yeah there was the traveler guys the gdw guys yeah and there was a okay. uh, battle tech had just come out but i don't i don't remember for sure but uh what happens? What happened with TSR was any niche that we weren't filling, um, other companies wanted to fill. So like horror with Cthulhu, we weren't doing that, and so Cthulhu happened, and BattleTech happened because we, while we were doing science fiction, we weren't doing, you know, we weren't doing uh, tactical science fiction on the battlefield, and so lots of niches like that were filled up by people wanting to, to. Uh, have fun and take advantage of the role playing craze. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because I it, it hit me in eighty four and you know, when it hit me I just I haven't looked back, so wow. Same so way. Yeah, same way. Yeah, so you, you guys had everything, every every type of genre and, and by this time I'm sure there was Boot Hill that was in a small little white box set. I remember like the D and D and then Star Frontier. So you know, if you had Metamorphosis Alpha, what was was that to bring Star Frontiers on? Was that more of a world? Set? But I know that Star Frontiers also had ship combat and stuff as well. But I, I don't understand why there would be both a you know Metamorphosis Alpha, seeing that it was already there, and then Star Frontiers later on. So now, that's see when Gam World came out, they stopped printing Metamorphosis Alpha. Oh, okay. Because it, they they weren't paying as much royalty on Game World as they were on MA. Oh, so I watched a a documentary a couple of years ago about the original TSR, and it talked about the the original building that you guys moved into. It was like an old, you know, ragged out building. Was that actually true? Where you know sometimes you would step through the floor and your foot would go through and stuff, or was that just that was that just for first offices the first offices were a house okay uh, yeah and then they they bought they bought an old hotel in the middle of town that's a it. three-story hotel 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and the the floors were okay, but the roof was terrible. <laughs> and the, the 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 employees of TSR love to go out on the roof and sun themselves on nice days. And so one day, Errol Otis went out on the roof and put his foot right through the ceiling. Oh no way! <laughs> yeah, because I remember that was a that was a pretty pretty big talking point, you know, in that document documentary and then you know it went into all of the old original art a lot of it was just thrown out and you know some someone caught a bunch of stuff being thrown out at some point and but man that that is uh that was horrifying to hear (laughs) i mean that was true that wasn't a good deal it wasn't very bright oh wow so when when you worked on advanced dungeons and dragons you had, you know, you had done the deities and demi gods book, and I, I remember I had a couple of these because I would always, I was the only one of my friends that actually I mowed lawns and I would also I worked part time as a bagger at a grocery store, so I was the only one that had money. So all my friends would borrow money from me when we got together on the weekends, and then when they couldn't pay me back, I would always repo their Advanced Dungeons and Dragons books, oh, and then well I ended up with, yeah, very well done because I actually got a couple of deities and demigods out of it. I had like seven fiend folios, and I mean I was just first edition. It just had tons of it, so. But I remember that the the deities and demigods had a problem with having Cthulhu, and I think uh, Melnib, and how you know, and I, and I guess you had to change it because of, uh, I guess the Lovecraft Association or something like that. That so this this is the ugly story that I tell. Uh oh. So young Jim Ward has been given the assignment of doing the AD and D hardbound book with the god pantheons and so i gave the list that i wanted to do to gary gary said gary approved the list but he said that i might have some problem with arkham house and cthulhu and the michael moorcock and elric um stories and maybe i should ask them for permission so he gave me the addresses he had the addresses and so i sent out letters to both of those companies saying hey i want to write this it'll be useful for you we'll give you we'll give you um a perk and, and talk about your books in the book and uh and will you let us do this and they both wrote me back and i'm i'm sorry to say those two letters are somewhere in the archives of wizards of the coast who knows where they are <laughs> but they both wrote me back giving permission so we we wrote the book but we didn't know that both of those companies signed contracts with Chaosium in California. They wanted to do role playing, just single role playing games based on those two um, pantheons. And so I don't blame, um, I don't blame Chaosium for being irritated when they saw Deities and Demigods come out. But uh, we had permission, so they sent us a cease and desist letter. Oh wow! And. And so they started talking, and we would have won the court case for sure, but TSR would have had to go to California and had to hire a California lawyer. And right then, Brian Bloom said they didn't have the money to do that. So they just stripped out both of those. And so so now years later, actually every year, some stupid person comes out and says, oh, TSR plagiarized those two. TSR stole them. And I tell you, it really irritates me a lot because I wouldn't plagiarize anything. Yeah. And, and, and I did what I had to do. I did my due diligence, yeah. but it, it didn't work out. So that's kind of the history of that. But, I mean, if you've if anybody's ever read and heard of Lovecraft to begin with, then they would know that it's not plagiarization. plagiarization is, you know, if you're calling it for what it's worth, you know, Cthulhu, I mean, it's not like you just took everything and just named it something else, then, yeah. So, yeah, I always wondered about that because I because I had several, I had both the first edition of Deities and Demigods and then I had later prints. 
And I always wondered why why Cthulhu disappeared. But then, yeah. you know, as I as I got older and got into school and and started doing some reading and then heard of Lovecraft, I'm like, oh, that's that's that could possibly be why, you know, it was taken out of uh, out of the deities and demigods book. But a little um, irritating. Let's move on. What you <laughs> Not trying to do that. Not trying to do that at all. So, speaking about TSR, how how long did you work for TSR? Oh, Twenty and years. Twenty, 20 years. years. Wow. So was that pretty much until the end of TSR around the early two thousands? Or uh, that's that's an ugly little story. Okay. Oh. So um, I was working at TSR. I was the vice president in charge of getting products done. I love the job. Yeah. We did great. The last two years I was there, we set sales records of over $40 million each year. Wow. Um, never sold that much before. But uh, Lorraine Williams comes to me, and, and she's looking to sell the company. And she wants to fire 20 of the editors and designers in the group. And I, and I try to explain to her, those people are the people that lay the golden eggs. We yeah. can't them. We can't do our job effectively if we fire those guys. And she said, "No, Jim, you, you're firing those guys." And so for two weeks, I argued and argued, and wow. I couldn't talk her out of it. So I said, "Fine, I, I'm not firing anybody, and I quit." Oh my goodness! To my wife's surprise and anguish. <laughs> And especially if I mean if the company's doing forty million a year at that point in time, I mean that that sounds pretty prosperous. I mean, wow. Very prosperous. Wow. So, do you have any cool TSR stories that you can share? No. No. <laughs> cool TSR stories. That's that's a toughie. Um 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 um. Did you guys used to play a lot of games back then too? With the you know the that's, different games and stuff, I bet you guys did. That's an interesting story. When I <laughs> so I rose up through the ranks um, at TSR, and uh, when I became the vice president, I said my people are going to learn about other people's games because they were like little Good turtles idea. stuck in their cubes, never sticking their heads out. So every Thursday afternoon, I made them all play different games that weren't TSRs. Oh, that's a good idea, though. Yeah, I know. They grumbled about it at first, but then they loved it, and we had a great, great good time. So, yeah, I love playing games. I love What I love doing is, is uh, watching the competition and what they were making. We had a games library, and with we would trade with other companies our products mm. for their products. So they got a good deal out of it because we produced like 10 times more than they ever produced. But yeah. we'd get products, other people's things. So I was able to read about Battletech, and I was able to read about Traveler. And, and so I was learning what the competition was doing, and I, I urged my people to beat the competition. Wow. So did you ever try one of those companies was uh, Talislanta, Bartel Games, I believe it was. Did you ever get to try that? Yes, I did. I, I read through it and liked it. Um, I, like, I like most of the stuff that people put out. Um, the only thing I didn't like was things that, that irritated parents. I called it the angry mother rule. We had an angry <laughs> mother rule. And TSR editors and designers were never supposed to make something in a product that would make a mother angry if she read it over the shoulder of her song. No. And see, it was, it was a great, it was a great um, drawing a line in the sand kind of thing because people would know what to do and what not to do on artwork and we had a big thing about nipples and artwork and on, uh, on uh, writing the, the stories that we wrote in the books so it was go ahead i believe there was one of these the small original D D games that had a, a naked woman on an altar and i believe that that cover had to be changed or something like that right you couldn't see your breasts and you couldn't see your butt yeah she was lying on an altar with no clothes. Yeah. And I remember there were like white drapes kind of draped over to cover everything. So, yeah. Wow. So, what was your, out of all of those games that you were playing that were not TSR products, did you have a favorite one that you always looked forward to playing? Ooh, ooh that's a good question. Well, of course, when, when Milton Bradley put out the, uh, 
the Fortress America game. Are you familiar with Fortress America? I remember seeing it as a kid, but I never played it. I got to play with the designer, Mike Gray. And mm. uh, I still, to this day, love that game. And I love Conquest, which is, was in the same series. Yeah. And I love Axis and Allies. Except in Axis and Allies, I was always trying to make a big German navy. <laughs> it never seemed to work. I put it, it in the Mediterranean, and, and I would use it to, to, to go out and, and invade America. But, uh, it, it was hard to do, very hard to do. Yeah, when, when I was younger, my father, he worked out at NASA, and several of the guys that he worked with, they played Axis and Allies. And, mm -hmm. you know, because my dad was into all that stuff. My dad got me into Lord of the Rings. He got me into The Hobbit and stuff. And then later on, you know, <laughs> this is good, too. Uh, he would he told me that he was playing Axis and Allies, but he told me that he, you know, there was that, that whole stigma with, you know, Dungeons and Dragons being affiliated with devil worshippers and all that stuff. And I got the sit down. I think it was what? It was Nightline with... Uh, was it uh, uh, Tom Brokaw or something like that that had that hour series? Actually, 60 minutes. Yeah, and I got the sit down. And, you know, my dad's like, well, I don't know if I want you playing this anymore. And I'm like, and that was the first time I ever said a curse word in front of my parents. Oh, I wow. told them, I looked at my, and my dad is a baby boomer, and he was in the Korean War, and my dad took no crap from me or my brother and i turned to him and i said if you believe this bull s because i heard him say it all the time i said i can't believe if you believe this bull s then that's ridiculous and uh so i started hiding all of my D, &D books in the oh. air i would take the air conditioner vents off of the floor and i'd stuff my books down in there and but it, you know eventually it passed i actually oh. had to have my friends come over and prove to my mom that you know, it was a good game, and all we did was drink Mountain Dew and eat cheese curls and wrestle around on the furniture and stuff. I mean, yeah. I do have a good story for you about that. <laughs> so the, the Christian left was giving us terrible problems about having demons and devils in the game. Because if you have demons and devils in the game, the players are summoning those demons and devils. <laughs> and so... And, and this was the time of second edition, and, and we, were, we were doing stuff. And, uh, and so I, cause I dealt with a lot of these people, and I realized one amazing feature. None of them were reading the products. They weren't paying any attention. They heard that they were... Word of mouth. Stuff. That's yes, what it is. Exactly. Yeah. Word of yeah. mouth. And so, so I said to Zeb Cook, no, maybe I said to uh, Jim LaFountain. I said to Jim LaFountain, Jim, change those to Batazoo and Tanari. So we didn't have demons and devils anymore in our game. <laughs> and so when, when people would bring it up and they brought it up all the time at conventions, we said, oh, no, we have taken demons and devils completely out of the game. <laughs> and we hadn't. We call them something different, but because we called it different and they never read the books, they didn't know that there were still demons and devils in the game. It worked. It worked great, and the Christians went away. Thank goodness. <laughs> so were they? I mean, was it getting to a chaotic point to where they were? I mean, I heard that they were coming and protesting out in front of the the building with uh, signs we'll, and stuff. Yeah. I'll tell they, you one. A couple things that we did that was just it was just awful. We were selling the Sears and Pennies, and they were doing a hundred thousand dollars each every year. Wow. Big chunk. Of yeah. Eight, eight mothers wrote letters to Sears and Pennies, said, this is a terrible game. You shouldn't be selling it. If you continue to sell it, we'll never shop at Sears or Pennies again. Eight women. And so they, they, they stopped. They stopped selling it. And then, well, this is kind of a bad thing, but it's kind of a good thing too. So in Louisiana, there was a big book burning. And they piled a hundred of the hardbound books together. Oh. Of Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual, and they burnt them. Wow. And and Gary was delighted. You know why, Gary? Because <laughs> they're going to buy him again. <laughs> they're going to buy him again. <laughs> yeah. Right. He says, yeah, all over the country. 
<laughs> do the mass book burnings. We don't care. Oh, we'll well, just was, have more prints. It got silly after a while, but we we managed to talk ourselves out of it, and and we got experts, educational experts, to testify on the useful parts of it. You know, on on the the looking at history and you know, on reading, on you know, all all the beneficial things from more playing. And so people generally turned around, and and now of course they have actors and actresses playing D and D. So everybody wants to play because the actors and actresses are playing. And I think that's so ridiculous. Myself. The nerds are the new jocks, James. Oh, I know. <laughs> you know, speaking about you know reading and stuff that you just mentioned. You know, my son when. My son got old enough and he got into that mysterious stage of, of his life, probably about four or five years old. He was, he found this book, the okay. old original Dungeons and Dragons rule cyclopedia. And man, he was looking through that. And my son was having, he was in kindergarten at the time and he was having problems reading. And when he saw this book, he asked me if I would help him read it, and I did. And I I'm telling you, this games like this, they help with reading. They help kids with social interaction with other kids. It, it, it does basic math, you know, even though it's just basic, you know, adding this. But Thacko also helped as well because of the negative numbers. So my, my son figured out negative numbers as a young kid. And by the end of, you know, kindergarten, he's one of the kids in the class that's going around and helping everyone else oh, with nice. reading and everything. So, oh, yeah, you wow. mentioned that. And, yeah, that this book helped my son so much. This isn't the original one. Actually, for Christmas, that just went past a couple of months ago, I sent him my original one, which was – the first book that I ever bought with my own money as as an adult, nice. and we had a couple of the old uh, the old black cover basic Dungeons and Dragons character sheet books that he and I would build all these characters. And his first character he made was named Brownie Beard, and he was a dwarf. And my son loved dwarves, the, the demi-human dwarf. And so I sent him all my original dice from when I was a kid. I sent him, you know, my original rule cyclopedia and, and the character sheet books that we worked on. And he called me and he was all upset telling me that. He goes, why did you send me your stuff? I said, because I wanted you to have it. And it's a, a big, uh, as, you know, a father-son thing, yeah, you know, bonding. that will always. Yeah. Sure. That will always, uh, you know, I'll never forget that. And uh, he, he was upset that I gave him that stuff. But I told him, I said, hey, I wanted you to have it. But he knows what he's getting one day. He knows. <laughs> he's, yeah, I hope he wants it. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I asked him that. And uh, he's, he's just getting back into playing uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and also Starfinder. He's he's playing those with uh, he works at uh, Starbucks. He's a he's a manager for Starbucks. So him and all of his friends uh, that are there, they're all starting to stay after work and play inside of the Starbucks and oh, you know, nice. stuff like that. So. Yeah. So. Whew. Yeah. But that, when you mentioned that, that just made that just made that come to my mind instantly because, you know, even though, you know, there was a lot of negative publicity word of mouth. That, that assass media assassination but yeah there's there's a lot of good things that can come from D and I, I saw it with I mean the reading levels of my son just skyrocketed because he wasn't reading you know just, just dumb books he didn't want to read or as what he called them dumb books he didn't want to read cartoon books he, and you know he's picking up big words and stuff and I'm going wow this you read all you want son so yeah Oh, yeah, he would he would take my my basic D and D books. I would only let him take uh, two or three books at a time. <laughs> it's sort of like checking out from the library, you know. And yeah. uh, it taught him responsibility too. And I told him, I said, you don't write in these books. You don't rip the pages out or anything. And he never did. He treated them. The, the demigods book. 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. He he saw that one, but he never got to. He never got around to that one. They send me pictures all the time of, of pictures from the D and D book. They're all colorized. Uh, well, that, I mean that would be. I guess that would kind of be cool, coloring them with pencils or whatever. I wouldn't do that though because I I love the old black and white art. That's that's what's always drawn me to basic Dungeons and Dragons and. Adva- a lot of advanced first edition was black and white too, but I know that there was a in second edition introduced all the colors and stuff like that. But you know, speaking of that, how and you said you were managing all of the products. How big of a task was that to manage three games going all at once? You know, you had basic D and D was going on till around ninety six. You had you know first edition. You had second edition. How how difficult was that? I mean, just to have like a timeline. No, no, it was pretty easy actually. We we were quite organized. Every December, we talk about the next year's product line, the whole line from from month to month mm-hmm. to month to month, and uh, and I had just excellent designers and editors who were able to keep a schedule. Awesome. And they, they had you know three months to six months to design something, and uh, and they came through every time we. The people at TSR were just the editors and designers and artists were just amazing, and uh, and they did a terrific job. And you could tell because we put out a ton of product every yeah, year. Yeah, you did. And usually we put it out on time or a little or a little ahead because we tried very hard to be three months early in our design times. So when we wow. promised something in May, you know, we really wanted it done in March. Wow. That's good. So, was it all done in house, or did you contract it out to a lot of smaller companies, like you mentioned? Uh, no, we used hundreds of freelancers, editors, and designers, and artists. Lots and lots of them. We did all the typesetting in house, but yeah. uh, but we yeah, we used lots of other other freelance people. Wow. So, when you left around, you know, after your twenty years at TSR. Yep. What what did you get involved with? Was it still in the gaming industry? And, you know, are you still within the game industry? Do you have any current projects going on? Oh, sure. Um, I, I stayed in the gaming industry and designed products. I helped with uh, collectible card games for a while. I helped with the Tomb Raider card game and and uh, the, uh, the Babylon 5 card game. And uh, I, I did a couple card games myself. And then, um, I, yeah, I've been designing up right up until today. So I did um, just just the last couple of years. I did. Uh, uh, I worked for a company called Fireside Creations They're down in Florida, and I did a science fiction game called Seventy Seven Lost Worlds, and a fantasy game called Dragon Scales. And the unusual feature of both of those games is that they use decks of cards instead of dice. That's good. So if, if a person wants to strike a target, he has to draw a heart when he draws cards. Or if, if he wants to jump over a pit, he needs to draw a high club to make it over the pit. So it's, it's dependent on the cards and the kind of cards you draw. Wow, I like that. I always liked card games. And the first time that I had ever seen cards used in a game was, was Savage Worlds, how they did their initiative with cards. So... That's that's a ingenious idea, especially when it dictates the actual results of being yeah. successful or not. So you right. actually go that much further and, and yeah. take it to the next level. That sounds interesting. Yeah. That's Fireside Creations. They're down in Florida. They have their own Facebook page as well um, for Dragon Scales and for 77 Lost Worlds. Awesome. And he has lots of support product for them. And uh, doing even more. He is He's a printer down there. Stephen Lee is his name. Very, very um, cutting edge kind of person that really supports the products that he's making. And we even, we even have done um, short story anthologies now. So there's like four or five different 77 Lost World short story anthologies. And there's, I think there's two Dragon Scales short story anthologies. Because he, he just... He, oh, he owns a print company, so he loves mm-hmm. to put out product for the people. And, he, and just like me, he realizes if you want something to be popular, you have to support it. You have to, yeah. That's I'm I'm huge in that. Those are 
because when, when I'm running a game, you know, unfortunately this is with Talos Lanta, it just wasn't, even though it was supported, it just lost that support over the years. And, you know, it, it was unfortunate, but yeah, I'm all about games that, that are being supported and, you know, with fireside games and, you know, 77 lost worlds and dragon fireside scale. Games. Fireside creations. All right. Yeah. I'll definitely get those links into the the video down below so people can check that out i think uh cards are a great way to kind of try something different and i'm all about trying trying different things you know i wanted to do i wanted to try something totally different yeah because it's pretty easy to get the dice these days but everybody has a deck of cards (laughs) yeah you're right so Dice. You mentioned dice, and this will be my last last TSR question for you. Now, did you guys make the dice in house at TSR, or oh my were, God. were those? That's, that's another amazing <laughs> story. Okay, so here we go. You're going to be very surprised about this. So, Young Jim Ward is an inventory control, and it's his duty to make sure that the boxes and the dice and the books for the D&D basic set come out on time every month. And we were selling 100,000 basic sets every single month, just like clockwork. Oh, my gosh. I so I mean, so who I'm, else is making dice at this time? I mean, there can't be too many manufacturers of dice. Well, not for, not for D4s and, you know, 12s. Yeah. I'm sure there's plenty for D6s, but... There was uh, there was couple of dice in New York, but we we worked with Hong Kong. We worked Hong Kong dice manufacturer, okay. And it took it took one month to make a hundred thousand dice, and three months to ship the hundred thousand dice overseas from Hong Kong to California. Wow. So just like clockwork, I had to make sure that I I went back in the schedule. So I had my December hundred thousand games. So I had to go back four months to, to make sure the dice landed to, to put them in the boxes. That wasn't a problem. So for th- four or five months, I was doing that. I ran just like clockwork. I was doing a great job. We always had enough. Then the vice presidents decided that they wanted to make their own dice because dice were kind of expensive. It was, it was cutting in the profit margin. And, you know, I could understand this completely. Yeah. So they had full support. So, but I was still ordering dice. So two months went by, and Kevin Bloom walks into the sales office and says to me, "Jim, don't order any more Hong Kong dice, cause we'll have them when you need them." Okay. Well, uh, at that point, I became terrified. <laughs> it was my duty to get the dice in the house, and we didn't have. We, they, they were just starting working on the dice molds, so I was I was very concerned. But I said yes, sir. So it got to be four months before I really needed to order the dice. So I went and asked, okay, how how are we on on the dice molds? How's it going? And and Kevin went in his desk. He opened his drawer. He took out what they were making for the dice molds. They looked like pieces of popcorn with numbers on them. <laughs> Oh, he says, I know these don't look very good, but we'll have them when you need them. Okay, so, so then it became then it became July, and I really needed to order Hong Kong dice for December. And so I sent a memo out to all the vice presidents. I, I need to order Hong Kong dice. Kevin told me not to. What do you want me to do? And Kevin comes storming into the sales office. He's enraged. He takes the memo. He balls it up in a little ball and tosses it in my face. Jim, you will not order dice. We will have them when we need them. (laughs) Okay, so he leaves, and I say to my vice president, Will Needling, I say, Will, the the dice look like pieces of popcorn. He isn't even... (laughs) What are we going to do? Because we need 100,000 of them. And Will said, Jim, when the vice president gives you an order, you must do whatever he says. I said, okay. So we got to July. I didn't order the dice. We got we got to August. And so if we didn't have dice, the 100,000 sets in December 
would not have dice in them, which was cataclysmic. Yeah. So I said, okay, they don't have the dice molds. What are we going to do? And Will says, okay, send one more memo to <laughs> Gary and Brian. I think Gary was the biggest, biggest boss, and Brian was the vice president. So I sent them memos explaining, right now, we don't have dice to the dice mold, and, and in December, we will not have dice for those boxes, those 100,000 boxes. And so Kevin comes storming in, saying, don't you ever send this memo again. <laughs> and, then, and then Gary went to Kevin, and I heard this secondhand, Gary went to Kevin's office and said, Kevin, let me see the dice you've got going in the mold. And so Kevin opened his desk. He pulled out pieces of popcorn with numbers on them. <laughs> oh, boy. Raged. He flew into my office and said, Jim, I'm really glad you notified me of this. You start ordering dice again, and you keep ordering them until I tell you to stop. <laughs> Fine, Gary. But we still were three months where we had to use cardboard chits. <sighs> they were counted with numbers on them. You tossed them in a cup. And you, and you drew out a number. I, I, I have a sheet of those, actually. Oh, go for big I was, money. Oh, I have a sheet. I was wondering why, you know, because D&D had already been out for a while. So, uh, like, why are these chits in there? And I'm a big word on chits because, you know, a lot of the modules like B10 and, you know, a lot of the, the battle stuff had chits. And everybody, every time I mention the word chits, everybody thinks that I'm saying the S word instead. So, <clears throat> so I always wonder, I'm like, why do they call them chits? Why don't they call them something else? It was a boon to the prisons. Because the prisons can't have dice, yeah. but they can have the chits. Oh, okay. We, we sold a bunch of them into prisons. But wow. it was a terrible experience for me. And from that day forward, Kevin Bloom hated me. Just hated me. Because, you know, if you're in charge of this, if it doesn't happen, whose head's going to roll? It's going to be yours. Exactly. Oh. I, I oh. just couldn't go. Just couldn't let it go. Oh. So, so you mentioned Fireside Creations. Do you, have any, do you have any current projects that you're working on that you can talk about? Well, sure. I, I, I'm doing, I'm doing um, I forgot, The Ruins of Cincinnati. We take Cincinnati 325 years from now. Oh, wow. And, yeah, we make it into a ruin, and you adventure in there looking for cool stuff that was among the destroyed ruin. That's and, awesome. And, yeah, I know. You, you find a police station, and there's the, the police equipment. Or you find a, a National Guard armory, and there's a there's a, the, the armory safe. Um, so it's just, it's just a fun exploration adventure. Um, that I'm working on. I'm also working on, it's called Ward Star. This is kind of funny. Um, I, I, kid, I kid Lee all the time, Stephen Lee, and I keep dropping his name in the adventures. So <laughs> one huge adventure that they did, a 12-part adventure, they were, they were making Lee pods, all right? And, and I think I might have irritated him just a little bit. I don't know for sure. But he said, Jim, we're going to do Ward Star. Because I never put myself in, in product. <laughs> in the product. He says, Jim, I want you to do Ward Star, and we're going to put it way out of the solar system, and uh, I want a fun thing with robots and, and adventures. So I've been working on that now for, for a couple months, Ward Star. And only it's only Ward Star because Stephen Lee is ordering me to do it. So does it have its own, along with, you know, Battle in Cincinnati, do those have their own, like, mechanics, or do they use any other previous mechanics? They all use the card mechanics. That's awesome. Yeah, it is, it's fun. It is. It just, and plus, you know, you can learn it in 10 seconds. Red cards are good. Black cards are bad. You now know how to play the game. Yeah. So, it's so easy to learn. That's awesome. So all the projects that you've worked on throughout all of the years – Oh, what yeah. is your favorite project that oh, you God. worked on of okay, all time? Know, I always get asked this question. Do you realize it is exactly like saying, which one of your three sons <laughs> do you like the most? <laughs> it's just to say, you know, I like them all, but I think um, yeah. I call I call the, the uh, Storyteller's Thesaurus. That's a book that comes out by Troll Wars. 
I call that my masterwork. Um, it's it's just a brilliant piece of it's a it's a regular thesaurus, but it's themed so that you know if you want to find a treasure, you can look up the treasure section at thesaurus, and it talks about twenty or thirty different historical treasures. Oh. Or if you, if you want to know about guns and ammo? There's a guns and ammo section that gives you a couple hundred different guns and different rifles and different ammo. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's an idea thesaurus that, that sells really well for troll lords. And, uh, and it just it just filled with millions of ideas. I still use it today in my design room. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's and, and, thesaurus. All right. Very good. Yeah, I'll have to get that link from you so we can put that in the, in the comment section too. It sounds like it would be an amazing supplement for any game. You know, yep. obviously being a thesaurus. Any kind of game design work or, or writing. Um, I've had I've had people from offices drop me notes saying, Jim, this thesaurus is just invaluable in the office memos that I write. <laughs> the office memos. Quite a compliment. Really. Quite uh, a compliment. So are, are you currently, are you running any games right now or are you playing any games? Playing well, in know, any games? Yeah, that's, that's the reason I couldn't. Um, have your session on Friday actually I uh, I run a game for uh, Jason and Nick they're they're authors out of California and they've authored the Galaxy Edge novels they're just amazing novels lots of fun and so I, I run a game for those guys every Friday from two o'clock to six o'clock that's awesome we use roll d20 um, for our our platform and uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. And so far, I haven't been able to kill off any of them. <laughs> I'll have to get you in uh, one of my basic Dungeons & Dragons games at some point if you'd want to play them. As long as I can play like a god, that'll be fine. Oh, we'll just break out the Immortals box set and go straight we'll for okay. level three. <laughs> we'll be all set, yeah. No, that's, I wouldn't mind that. So. Oh. We'll playing time. I'm kind of like Gary. Gary loved playing Metamorphosis as Alpha because... You know, he was a referee all the time, all the time, all the time. So he got tired of being a referee. I mean, he was he was the best referee I've ever seen in my life out of thousands of referees. Referees, but he he also loved playing, and so I only killed him once in Metamorphosis Alpha in 30 years of playing with him. So that that's pretty amazing, I'll tell you. And uh, he was just an excellent player, very very good. That's awesome. I like I like how you met him. You know, you, you having your seven books with Conan and other stuff, and and him having his seven the same exact. I mean, it was just. It seems like it was just destined for yeah, you def to to meet. Sorry, yeah, my life would have been very different if I wouldn't have met him. Oh, that's amazing. So there's one of the things that I that I want to bring up with you, and that's your your virtual seminar that you have coming up. Uh, on May 16th and May 17th of this month. Uh, I'm also going to put links up to that as well. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about of uh, you know what's going to go on with the virtual seminar? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So up to 50 people can sign up for it. And the, the one on Saturday is on, on designing a role-playing game, um, one adventure. And what you need to consider and what you need to do and I have a handout sheet that I give out um, as a PDF at the end of that seminar. So people will, will walk away with, with the notes that I give them for doing that. And then Sundays is, is doing a role-playing game system, entire system. And what you need to consider when you are trying to write a game like D&D or trying to write a game like Battletech. And so again, there'll be a PDF at the end to hand out, but basically it's it's using my 40 plus years of experience in what I've learned. Um, it's things like, you know, you have to have a website. If yeah. You don't plan on being a success if you don't have a website. And I also suggest a Facebook page. Um, things like that. And, and things like getting a printer to quote you out how much it's going to cost to print the books before you even do design work. Yeah. So just little tricks of the trade like that because you know, getting quotes is free. You just call up the printer and say, I got a 32-page book. What can you do for me? Yeah. You know, and so it just things you you got to consider when when you are either making an adventure or making a role-playing game system. Awesome. 
Well, I'll definitely be seeing you on May 16th and 17th. And that, that was going to be one of my other questions where the seminar is going to be different for those days. So that's that's good I, to know. The same thing all the time, I tell you. And I've been doing these seminars for a couple of years now. So I, I pretty much got it down pat. Awesome. Well, I'm also going to put that up there on the uh, – on the description for the video so people can also check out your seminar and i know that uh, i will definitely be there on the 16th and 17th so it cost you two bucks a piece buddy uh, that's 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 uh yeah big big money so what's the difference between the the convention ticket and the seminar ticket because there's a five dollar convention ticket also oh, is that for the entire convention uh, i have no idea I'm, that's cool they, Errol Johnson gives me a call and says, Jim, hey, I'd like you to do this. And because oh. I like Errol Johnson a lot. I got you. And I will, I will work for two hours on Saturday and two hours on Sunday. Well, that's cool. Oh, so, so it's a convention of many seminars going on that weekend then. Oh, that's yes. cool. That's cool. Well, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that we found that. So, but, well, James, it's been an honor to have you on uh, my stream and uh, kind of you to say yeah I, I i mean it's it's an honor and I, and seriously i know i've already said it but i'm so glad that uh we were able to get together and uh talk for about an hour and it, it's nice to hear those stories and you know dive into the not so favorite cthulhu the 80s and <laughs> oh, my God. i tell you every year every year two or three stupid people say I plagiarize those two. Yeah. It just it drives me crazy because you know what? It's it's a mark on my honor. Yeah. And I, I just I just hate it. So I, well now you can I refer him to this video and say, <laughs> "Here's the story," and we'll put a time stamp on it, yeah. so people can take the time and actually learn the real facts mm -hmm. of what happened. There so, we go. all right, James. Two letters. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta get with Watsy and yeah, get that, copies that, of those level uh those letters. Not friends. That's all there is to Oh, not friends with Watsy, huh? Oh boy. Oh well, not gonna bring anything up there then. <laughs> so, Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hit up some questions in, in chat. So if you guys have any questions, minus deities and demigods. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ask away in the Twitch chat now. So thank you everybody again for hanging out. Uh, that is uh, very nice. Everybody's hung out and watched the stream. So yeah. So uh, one person was asking uh, that they're getting here a little bit late. And what are the seminars again? The two different days. Sure, they're, they're next Saturday and Sunday at 2 o'clock Wisconsin time. And the first one is on um, creating a role-playing adventure. And the one on Sunday at 2 o'clock is on creating a role-playing game, game system. Awesome. In fact, uh, Bell... Uh, Good old she is. Still listening right now? Yeah, she is. Yeah, she's okay. asking. Wait, just just a second, just a second. Bell, <laughs> I'm amazed and pleased with how thorough you are. He's a lucky man to have you do anything, and he should be giving you presents and money and all sorts of things. Oh, <laughs> uh, I do. I I believe me. I appreciate what she does. She has, she has made me in the short time that she's been helping me. She's really made me step my game up. As All well, right. because everything was so laid back, and you know, work's been really busy. But yeah, she's she's really done a fantastic job, and I I am question? very appreciative. Yeah. So she's asking, what is your favorite sci-fi book? Oh my God! Okay, that's like asking which one of your ten cousins is your favorite cousin. <laughs> All right, that, that's a fair question. My favorite book is a book by Robert Heinlein called Time Enough for Love, and it was the only novel that I've ever read in, I want to say, 50 years of reading novels where I bawled like a baby in the middle of the book. Wow. It's this so sad part where the, the main character's love dies, and she's on another world, but he has described Earth so many times that when she's dying, she says, 
I can hear the geese. And she, there is no geese on the world. But because he's described it so well so many times, she can hear it. Oh, my God. It was so, such a poignant moment. <laughs> I just cried and cried and cried. Yeah, I've had a few books like that as well. But yeah. they, weren't, they weren't science fiction, though. But I won't. Uh, I won't say what books they were. <laughs> so. You can't punch. So I have a, another question here. Well, actually, it's no not a question, but Pernicious Pilfer is saying that we need to start a petition to demand that Wizards of the Coast releases Mister Ward's two letters vindicating him. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a great idea, but they won't be able to find them in their yeah. in their archives because you know they. From TSR, they must have taken a whole semi-load of legal documents. And I mean a semi-load. So I'm sure they put those all in boxes and put them in the corner of Wizards of the Coast. And they haven't looked at it since. Uh, so, um, they yeah. probably have the semi still parked out back or something like that. I just sitting like, in the corner. Oh, like a pod. Yeah, no, I, I wish we could find them, but it's never going to happen. And Gorgio uh, has no questions. But he says that it is very awesome to sit here and watch and listen to us speak about, you know, gaming, TSR and stuff. So that's that's really okay. nice. Telling Gorgio that he's been hooked, uh, hooked, locked up in his house too long and needs <laughs> to find something fun to do. <laughs> he's running a bunch of games, I think. I think Gorgio is running quite a few games. So he's, I think he's definitely been locked up in the house especially during you know the epidemic going on and stuff so let's see uh there's another question by svenster 77 in 30 years of metamorphosis alpha did the ship ever encounter another ship oh excellent excellent question as a matter of fact an alien crystal vessel has latched on to the side of the ship and they're invading and trying to take over the ship. And so they have control of two of the 17 levels. Wow. So there you go, Spencer. Spoiler go. alert. Spoiler alert. There's a crystal vessel. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what are a couple of your of the names for your characters that you've played in the past? Oh, boy. Okay, so... My, my favorite, well, I played a wizard at Gary's for all the all the 35 years that he was alive. And it was, this is, I know this is kind of stupid, but you know Bombadil from Tolkien? Oh, yeah. Tom Bombadil. Okay. I, I, reversed, I reversed his name. It was like, <laughs> little bomb. I know, I know it's dumb. But, you know, I was in, I was 23. <laughs> what the heck? So that's my... It's my favorite wizard character. I only play wizards in, in D and D and A D and D because I love them. Um, but but I had uh, I had Gamma Boy. Gamma Boy was pretty famous. Oh, there perfect. For a yeah, Gamma Boy. And uh, what else was the one? I, I had Captain Jim. Captain Jim was one of the three captains on the starship, and he's the only one left alive. Actually, um, he's in stasis uh, in the middle of a lake. So he's yet to be found. Ooh. Yeah. I like that. My my first character's name was Jonathan Abbotty. That was my basic Dungeons and Dragons character. At least it isn't a stupid name. <laughs> uh, well, here's where you may think it uh, got stupid. I'll tell uh -huh. you a little story about my D and D experience. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So my we're probably about level fifteen or level twenty, which was you know we got level twenty. Jeez. We survived. I, we played the same game from eighty four to around two thousand when everybody started, you know, ruining their ruining their lives and getting married and getting girlfriends and stuff uh, and getting jobs. So we actually made it to level thirty one. And but during the I'd say the low teens. I wanted to change my name because I, I started reading the Dark Elf trilogy. Oh, yeah, sure. So I, I wanted to change my name from Jonathan Abity to Dritston Dewardak. And my DM was like, what the heck? He's like, that is the worst name that you could ever have for a cleric that's a human. 
oh, because wow. in basic D and D, you know, your class and race are mixed up as one. He goes, he goes, dude, you are not going to pass that off. And he goes, I'm not going to allow it. So about a year later, I found a wish scroll and he goes, you can do whatever you want with the wish scroll. And I said, okay, I'm changing my name to Dritzton Duerdak. Oh my and God. He got so mad. My, my DM James got so mad, but he, he allowed me cause it, it was economy control and it got rid of that very powerful wish scroll. Yeah, you know what I would have done if I was a judge, I would have made, turned you into a draw. <laughs> That's a good thing because there were shadow elves, they were called in basic D and D before, you know, the, the vault of the drow and stuff like that came out. So I remember, yeah. I remember Gary's comment when, when someone asked him, what do you think of Driss Warden?" And Gary said, he's insane. And, <laughs> and, and the guy says, what do you mean by that? He says any drow that wants to live above the ground and wants to do things that aren't evil, is totally insane. <laughs> I thought that was I, amazing. Yeah, he's I, right. I never had the guts to tell Bob Salvatore that. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that I'm like, why is he? Well, he's considered a renegade, so I was like, why? Why does he want to be out and you know in the sunlight and everything else? So that's that's funny that uh, Gary mentioned that. So any more questions? Yeah, and Gorgio actually said that yes. Uh, and he laughed and he said, gaming is his life. So that's, oh, that's good know. to hear. So, but I don't think it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So yeah. I, I really appreciate it again, James. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, if you're up to it down the line, we'll have you on again and talk about yep. what you got going on. This has been okay. Just as long as you don't mention DDs and demigods. I, I promise next time there will be no mention of it. Now that I know the official scoop of it. Oh, so. there we go. All right. Very good. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. All right. Thank you very much, James. I appreciate it. And have a good night. And uh, we'll talk again soon. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye for now.